If you've listened to Brewlosophy at all, you know how much we love Imperial Yeast. The company was founded on the ideal that if you're going to do something, do it right. From their Imperial Pitch Right pouches, packing a whopping 200 billion cells of healthy and viable yeast in each pouch, to their commitment to commercial customers guaranteeing 10 of their most popular strains are in stock for orders up to 20 liters, or the shipping is free, Imperial Yeast does it right. No more worrying about whether you need to make a starter or propagate your yeast prior to pitching. Imperial Yeast makes it easy for the home brewer and commercial brewer to obtain direct pitches at proper rates when you need it. To place a commercial order or to get more information about everything that Imperial Yeast has to offer, head on over to imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. Hops are one of the core four ingredients of beer, contributing to the intense, fruity, tropical, juicy, grapefruit, and passion fruit character of modern IPAs and pale ales. While some modern varieties like Cascade are public varieties, meaning they can be grown by anyone, others like Citra, Mosaic, Simcoe, etc. are private, which means they can only be grown by licensed growers. There are a few private hop breeding efforts funded by companies like John I. Haas and Hopsteiner, but who's funding public hop research? I'm your host, Kay Job, and today I'm speaking with Tom Nielsen, who's Research and Development and Raw Materials Manager at Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Well, Tom is actively involved in two groups dedicated to improving hop quality and funding development of new hops with new flavors for public use, and that's um, the Hop Research Council, which was funded several decades ago by a collective group of hop growers, distributors, and brewers, both large and small brewers, by the way, uh, to fund hop research. That's their whole goal, was to fund hop research research, hence the name Hop Research Council. Um, Tom's also part of the Hop Quality Group, which was founded in 2010 by a group of craft brewers to promote hop quality in the industry and also be a voice for craft craft brewers with respect to hops. So Tom's affiliated with both groups and is actively involved in public breeding programs and funding research to improve hop quality. Well, today I'm going to be talking with Tom about those two groups' efforts to breed for thiol, or to to breed hops, but specifically to breed for thiols, those tropical, fruity, passion fruit, guava, and smelly armpit flavors that people enjoy uh, in New Age IPAs and pale ales. So we're going to talk about thiols generally, but spend most of the show talking about the work of the HQG and the HRC to fund public hop breeding programs. Don't forget to check out patreon.com slash brewlosophy if you haven't already. For just a small monthly contribution, you get access to unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session. And this month's guest is Brian Huntley of Short Circuited Brewers, which is a group of home brewers dedicated to bringing knowledge and understanding of electric brewing to the masses. So if you've got questions about switching your home brewing or pilot scale systems to electric, Brian will have you your answers. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by Friday, J- uh, September 23rd. Also, please keep leaving those ratings and reviews wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. If they allow you to rate and review the show, please do so. It helps our listeners find the show and it helps me know uh, how and where to improve the content. So we're up over 75 reviews at Apple Podcasts and I read every one that comes through. So thanks to Cycle Man and to Jeff Claus um, who re- left reviews this month. This week's feedback is brought to you by the imaginative crew at Haas, who have developed a revolutionary way to dry hop using Spectrum, a flowable 100% hop-derived product that is fully dispersible in cold side applications for great flavor, efficiency, and less beer loss. No solids means less loss, and it's fully dispersible in cold beer, so there's no contact or residency time required like traditional dry hopping. Spectrum fully disperses immediately, so you don't need to wait 24 to 48 hours or worry about double dry hopping, and you don't have to have any special dry hopping equipment. It stores easily, it's easy to use, saving you precious time, and getting the most yield from each batch. It's currently available to commercial brewers in trial quantities of Citra and Mosaic, so check it out by visiting johnihaas.com. That's John, the letter I-H-A-A-S dot com. All right, listener Greg wrote in asking about standards for developing a hop a lexicon, and I gave my thoughts in a prior episode, but I also promised to get Jeff Daly's thoughts as well. Uh, so here's Jeff's question, and then, or I'm sorry, here's Greg's question, and then Jeff's response. So Greg says, Hi, Cade, really enjoyed the episode with Jeff Daly about developing a sensory vocabulary. 
I want to do more sensory exploration and was wondering about how best to start. I could go buy a bunch of beers from the liquor store, but that could get expensive in a hurry. Are there any beers that you recommend for specific flavors and aromas? What's the best way to figure out sensory differences? So Jeff's response says, hi, Cade, the listener is asking the right questions. Exploring as many beers as possible is always the more correct answer as batch consistency, shelf life, storage issues make uh, as batch consistency, shelf life and storage issues make assigning specific brands to specific flavor groups very very difficult. Additionally, distribution of certain brands, even big ones, can be spotty depending on your location. However, he says, I can give a bit of advice to narrow things down as I appreciate that research like this can get very expensive very quickly. So for herbal, spicy, and floral aroma, uh, he suggests as fresh as you can get Pilsner or Kell. So he says Pilsner or Kell is famously 100% Sots from the Zatek uh, region in Chechnya. Uh, and this is when fresh, the beers really highlights the nuances uh, that hops can bring to lighter hop forward lagers. Uh, then he says for floral and pear or green fruit, he get Coors Light. <laughs> Enough said, really. He says the ester profile of Coors Light is incredibly unique and identifiable. For citrus, Elysian Super Fuzz. And this is, uh, he says, this is a bit of a cheat since Elysian adds actual blood orange to the beer, but for a 100% hop-driven citrus character, there are other options like Stone Delicious and Scorpion Bowl, uh, but generally look for the use of Citra, Centennial or Cascade, Simcoe, and Azaka, and you should be good. Uh, for Tropical and Stone Fruit, he says this is a bit more complicated because delving into the differences between guava, mango, peaches, passion fruit, lychee, etc. involves a lot of elements of personal sensitivities surrounding the sulfur compounds responsible for tropical fruit or thiols, like we're going to be talking about in this episode. And he says these compounds are also significantly impacted by shelf life. So look at uh, tin barrel profuse juice or um, he says as as a hot person, I shudder the Hop Valley Mango and Stash Cryo IPA, Firestone Hop No is a great option, as is New Belgium's Juice Force DIPA, but be careful, it's 9.5%. Uh, for Melon, he says Tin Barrel Rock Hop Cold IPA is a surprisingly good option for this. It's cantaloupe and pumpkin rind or strong notes over a basic fruit salad. And uh, finally, for Barry, he says, your guess is as good as mine. I've worked with some fruited lambics uh, with his panel, Creeks, Framboise, etc. Uh, because Barry from hops is very rare, even in Mosaic, and not that many 100% Mosaic IPAs are available, let alone examples that highlight the blueberry notes that are present in Mosaic. Uh, so he says, you know, uh, maybe some berries themselves uh, would be good for berry aroma in hops. Um, he says, in terms of how to figure out the sensory differences, this is a great opportunity to pair up with a buddy or two. To serve each other blinded triangle tests of two beers and make it a requirement to identify how the samples are different from each other, rather than just stopping with basic discrimination. Outlining the nuances of your perception, especially verbally, with others drinking the same beer realigns your palate and allows for stronger flavor rebinding. So that's creating new memories associated with sensory experiences, especially aromatic ones. So Jeff says, hope this helps. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to answer that question. And Greg, uh, Thanks for the awesome question. So I'm going to take a quick break and then I'll be back with Tom Nielsen to talk about public hop breeding for thiols. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the time's IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than MoreBeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. As listeners of the Brew Lab, it's likely you're the creative type who likes trying out new stuff. Well, your creativity does not have to end at fermentation. Head over to grogtag.com and create your very own set of custom homebrew labels that feature professionally designed templates you can adjust or simply upload your own artwork and they will print that bad boy up for you. Grogtag's labels are water resistant, meaning they won't peel off or run in the ice chest and they're reusable. Just peel them off and slap them on your next round of bottles or cans. So get creative and let grogtag.com put the final touches on your fermented greatness. Grog tag. At least your beer will look good.
IPA is the number one selling craft beer style in the United States, driven largely by the intense tropical citrusy and fruity aromas contributed by hops. Recent research has shown that thiols are a big contributor to tropical and citrus character. And while most of that research has been done in the wine industry, looking uh, to describe the intense tropical characteristics of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, there's an increasing amount of research looking into how to improve the thiol character in beer. So today in the lab, I'm talking with Tom Nielsen, who's Research and Development and Raw Materials Manager at Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Tom, welcome to the Brew Lab. It's great to be here, Cade. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, I'm, well, I'm happy to have you. Now, have you, have you, have you ever brewed an IPA? Oh, no. Only, only Pilsner and Hellas. <laughs> I feel like I had to ask that, right? I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about a, a you know, hops episode. Uh, but of course, right? Sierra Nevada makes two of my absolute favorite IPAs, which are Torpedo and Hazy Little Thing. Um, and they're just solid. I mean, they're, they're the go-tos, right? The ones that you go to, you know, you're like, I want to drink an IPA. It's on the shelf. That's what I'm grabbing. And then, of course, the style-defining pale ale, all right, which also features hoppy aroma. But we're um, we're not just talking about those beers. We're talking about thiols um, and also the public breeding efforts to increase thiols. So we'll jump into those in uh, in a bit. But what, maybe we should start. Why are thiols important to beer? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think brewers have long been obsessed with with sulfur chemistry in different forms. Uh, you know, so many papers, so many great, so much great research over the years on things like DMS, SO two. H2S, these are all different, you know, impactful sulfur uh, compounds and sulfur chemistry in beer. Um, Not until maybe 25, 30 years ago did we really uh, have an awareness of these little uh, minute uh, concentration level sulfur compounds called thiols, uh, largely coming from hops. Um, you know, they really drive um, a, a, a lot, uh, in, in many cases, the majority of aroma impact, certainly in IPAs. And they're just a great source of, of hop varietal differentiation um, when you're looking to get different flavors from your hops. Um, they're, you know, they're, their impact is so high and, and they're, um, you know, the different ratios of different thiols and presence of different thiols can really do a lot to to express different flavors from, from hops. So it's it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah, which is interesting, right? I mean, because we talk about like we, we've mentioned on this show, although I don't think we've done a deep dive into like terpenes and, you know, uh, sesquiterpenes and terpene oxides and all that as as uh, key drivers of uh, uh, of a hop aroma and flavor, which they are. Uh, but thiols, like you mentioned, are are this little tiny compound. Well, not, you know, tiny in the scale of, you know, hop, hop uh, active compounds, but they carry a really big load, a really big shoulder or a really big. They, they, they carry a huge load of the weight. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, in terms of uh, impact and odor activity, they really punch way above uh, their, their weight class or their concentration class. So you're talking about parts per trillion level, which, you know, up until recently, you can't, you know, people just yeah heard that term and said impossible. That's just ridiculous. But it's, it's very, very true. Um, and there's just a lot of research to support this. And it's, it's basically just in the last, you know, five, 10 years become part of, of the lexicon for, for many, many brewers out there. And I think, um, certainly a lot of the innovative IPA brewers focus on this. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I want to get into, I want to sort of dig into all of that. Um, you know, the, the, in terms of the show, well, that's what we're going to spend some time doing. We're going to talk about files, what they are, why they're in beer, all that, um, what the concentrations there are in hops, why they're important, et cetera, et cetera. But then also want to spend some time talking about your efforts, uh, with the hop research council and the hop quality group. Uh, that's a big reason why we're going to do, uh, this show. So I think that's a nice segue, uh, uh, sort of into se- talking about uh, you. So you, again, are the research and development manager um, and raw materials manager at Sierra Nevada, but you're also president of the Hop Research Council and technical committee chair of the Hop Quality Group. So I guess we should start at the beginning. What made you want to get into brewing? Um, well, uh, let's see. I think it's really probably has a lot to do with my father. Um, so he and I uh, started home brewing together in the late 90s. And actually, my dad was uh, a flavor chemist and a beer enthusiast all throughout oh, my whole life, so probably before then. <laughs> um, so he he was actually an early craft brewing conference contributor in the 90s when 
it was like 60 people showing up to these conferences. And I remember helping my dad uh, do a lot of this analysis in his, in his lab uh, when I was you know, just starting college or maybe even in high school. Uh, I remember um, he was working on hefeweizen and yeast, uh, uh, different wheat yeasts, hefeweizen yeasts. And we brewed like six or seven different uh, uh, wheat beers and did full sensory on them and did a lot of different uh, analytical because he was really uh, probably one of the first high powered kind of uh, analytical guys that would, that got into to craft beer. So yeah, he, I have pictures of him in like 1997 at a craft brewers conference presenting this work. Um, you know, I think it was the first time, uh, you know, craft brewers heard a lot about these flavor compounds and, and things and such. So he, he got himself well infiltrated into craft brewing at that time. I graduated from, from Rutgers, uh, with food science degree, uh, in 2003, and um, that's right when Ken and the team here at Sierra Nevada were building out their R&D facility. And I was the first hire into that facility uh, there in late 2003, early 2004. So that's just kind of how it happened. I'd been homebrewing. I had um, some experience working in a flavor house as an undergrad there at Rutgers. Knew how to run a bunch of this analytical stuff, high-end analytical flavor chemistry, GCs, mass specs, all that stuff. And just kind of it was really remarkable that you know right as i was graduating um sierra nevada was building out all these capabilities so i came in here to, to help build it out and just kind of been doing it ever since wow new jersey to chico california that's quite a ways yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that was uh several days in a u-haul uh, for sure yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i can yep. understand that i mean i thought it was a long way from texas to oregon but no i mean i think that's got me beat <laughs> yeah that was that was the halfway point i had I stopped by my parents house in austin Oh. Uh, as the midpoint there. So yeah, yeah that, was, that was a fun trip. Well, I love Austin. Uh, that's obviously where I was from. Uh, but but yeah, but, but cool. So your dad got you into this and you got involved in the analytical chemistry lab. And if I heard you right, that was around 2003, 2004. So you've been at Sierra Nevada for almost 20 years. 18 and a half years. Yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations yeah, on yeah. that. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and yeah. as part of that role, you've kind of got, you've gotten involved in these two other organizations, right? The Hop Research Council and the Hop Quality Group. So why don't you talk to us about those? Sure. I'll start with Hop Research Council. So um, my first uh, Hop Research Council meeting that I attended, if I remember correctly, was 2006 in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So I'd actually been kind of hanging around the HRC for quite a, quite a while before I joined the executive board in 2015. Um, and I've seen a lot of change in this industry through my interaction with Hop Research Council. Let me let me tell you. Um, so when I when I showed up, you know, the first time in 2006 or so, there was again maybe nine, ten people in the room, wow. and it was uh, A B. You know, the infamous Val Peacock was sitting there, um, a representative from Miller at the time, um, and you know the, the merchants, the Haas and the Steiner folks were there. Um, and not much else. It was really very limited uh, voice, not to say there was anything negative about it, but it just wasn't as inclusive of an organization. People actually just didn't know about it, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a lot of things just happening, um, that was impacting everybody. And, you know, I was very fortunate at Sierra Nevada and, and, and Ken Grossman took an interest in all these organizations, and I was kind of the uh, the young guy with you know the, the fresh skills um, that I got involved in all this stuff very early on for Sierra Nevada. Um, so you know I think Ken's vision to join AMBA American Malting Barley Association, join Hop Research Council in the early two mm thousands -hmm. was really was really un unique. And I, I think I was one of the beneficiaries of that for sure, just to get involved and and meet all these people at such a young age yeah. at such an impactful time too. Um, so fast forward in 2015, I, I finally got voluntold to, to join the board. <laughs> I think I got elected at some point. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think I actually, um, had suggested Chris Swarzy from the BA, mm -hmm. um, to, to, to run and he declined and he immediately countered by, uh, suggesting <laughs> that I, I, uh, run for the board Fun um, how that works. <laughs> and uh, that's just how it happens sometimes. Right. You got to be careful. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's been, it's been a fun trip um, with the HRC. I'm in my last six months as president. 
we're actually uh, hiring, rehiring our technical director position right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one of the big things that I was involved in in the last, oh, I say seven and a half, eight years is we created the technical director position for Hop Research Council. So it's not just a volunteer led organization. There's a lot of great continuity in it right now. Mm-hmm. And we've really, we've really started building out this, um, uh, you know, this nonprofit to, to really do a lot of great things for the industry. Um, so we really get involved in funding research. Uh, basically, that's that's it. Uh, highly collaborative organization um, founded in 1979, actually. Oh, wow. uh, so it's got quite a legacy. Um, yeah, um, anything from soil research to, you know, we're very active in breeding. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we collaborate very closely with hop growers of America, with the Washington Hop commission oregon hop commission idaho hop commission Mm -hmm. um but yeah um highly collaborative group really work well together we've expanded membership greatly Uh, i think we're maybe you know as i mentioned back in those early days we were a very small group uh definitely less than 10 members but now i think we're well over 30 maybe 40 now uh between full and associate membership so um yeah yeah we do a lot of single hop brewing trials uh, evaluating new varieties Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, we fund a lot of research from Oregon State over all these years mm-hmm. um, on on beer quality and hop uh, hop quality as it relates to to beer quality and beer innovation. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Definitely check out the Hop Research Council website yeah. for more information, and and certainly you can reach out to me or any of the membership if if any of your listeners want more information. Well, yeah, sure. And and you know, one of the things you mentioned for Hop Research Council is your hop breeding efforts. And again, that's one of the mm-hmm. things I want to talk about today, and especially sort of how that relates to thiols. I can't even mm-hmm. imagine that that people were talking about thiols back in two thousand six or two. You know, whenever you were first there as part of Hop Research Council. Yeah, I think the first brewing papers on thiols were published in oh six oh seven by oh, okay. by Japanese researchers. Um, so. At that point, I was very aware of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I have a, an olfactory report on a GC here that I, I pretty much spent all of 2004, 2005, 2006 <laughs> on. That's that was like my graduate degree, or, uh, just kind of hanging out in the lab here. At the same time, I was helping run the hop farm that we had just installed at the brewery. So that you know, my marriage of analytical and hops was just uh, it was it was. It was a lovely marriage, let's just put it that way. And <laughs> yeah. um, but it was deep. It was very deep there for for several <laughs> years. So I was very aware of all the different thiols and different varieties and things like that. I just didn't quite know how to talk about it. Um, and I, you know, the analytical power to positively identify them beyond uh, an olfactometry piece mm-hmm. um, wasn't quite there. And then these papers started to come out in 06 and 07 out of Belgium, Belgium and Japan, and they were really uh, starting to to find things out. Um, I gave a presentation in 2007 at Oregon State, the first international brewer symposium on hops. And I was talking about 4MMP levels in Chinook hops, which I had found uh, oh, wow. to be quite high. Yeah. I, you know, and then I, and then we were talking about all these other monoterpenic alcohols and all these things as well. So hop breeding in HRC um, is really where the public hop breeding effort has lived uh, or did live um, throughout the 80s, 90s. And 2000s, you know, we had um, a great breeder named Al Honnold who bred, you know, Centennial, uh, Cascade, Willamette, all these hops from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And then uh, as Al retired, John Henning came in and he's still the breeder. Mm -hmm. And um, the focus at that time on public breeding became more development of molecular tools, uh, less so traditional breeding. Mm-hmm. And that kind of was a, a little bit of a conflict for the industry. Uh, I think a lot of the growers expected the high throughput uh, breeding success that we we had seen for years and years and years, where John's mandate from from the USDA maybe was to let's beef up the science, the modern molecular, you know, the genetic uh, fingerprinting, all that stuff. So he had kind of conflicting interests, and actually. From the time I joined HRC until more recently, uh, until very recently, the public breeding program really did not have many successes at all. Um, so as I kind of came onto the board at HRC, uh, at the same time, we had really started getting a lot of wins at the hop quality group 
too on public breeding. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess I I can't talk about this before introducing the Hop Quality Group, um, which is a group that craft brewers founded in Providence at a brewing summit, much like the one that's happening next month. Yeah. Um, in 2010, I believe. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, right. So, uh, just a small group of us were just kind of grabbed, a, grabbed, a, um, a little meeting room at that, at the, um, I believe it was actually an MBAA national that t- at the time, but, um, and really, you know, folks like me and, and, and John Mallett and a few others had been discussing the, um, you know, the sale of AB uh, to, to InBev and what that had, uh, what the ramification for the hop industry was going to be and that they had kind of, um, absolved their hop quality program in the U S. Uh, and we were concerned about that. Yeah. So there was this kind of a, there was a vacuum in, in hop quality, at least perceived vacuum in hop quality with AB kind of really downsizing their, their hop uh, expertise in the U.S. You know, they let go of Val Peacock. Um, so we formed this group, the Hop Quality Group. And the, one of the first things we did, I think we were like six or seven members at that time, um, founding members. One of the first things we did was hire Val Peacock to be our consultant. <laughs> and then over the years, we've done just numerous trials. Really, we've built a really great legacy in in just uh you know d- doing some some great visits with growers uh pre-harvest visits um a lot of barbecues and picnics and, and cookouts and lots of beers shared with growers over the years and now i think we're over 60 members now wow okay so awesome. we've really yeah we've really kind of been an extremely inclusive uh, organization uh which is great to see that we went that direction um and um in 2014 or so 15 when we kind of had developed a little bit of a war chest and our our membership was growing growing we went in and made a big investment in the oregon state hop farm that had become kind of neglected for a few years this is where john henning was doing his breeding uh we put a lot of money into um basically clean up the whole system, you know, funded a lot of, uh, new trellis, um, and so on and so forth funded, um, a new position, a farm manager position, Angela Randazzo, um, who's been doing an amazing job for us and then started commissioning crosses. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had a very clear set of goals, very different from HRC. So HRC, um, I'd say serves a lot of different types of members from growers to merchants to big macro brewers to small brewers. And the goals are, you know, really well balanced um, to to take care of all these different groups, I would say. Hop Quality Group is a lot more focused on what craft brewers uh, want and need. I see. And I think flavor is number one. Yeah, I think we're we have uh, the luxury to be a little bit more tunnel visioned and go deep into things, and and we've commissioned hops uh, for flavor, and <laughs> um, it turns out, um, which I kind of always knew all along, I had to get a lot of people on board on this over the years, but uh, we're looking for high thyle lines, huh. and and lines with new and unique thiols or unique ratios of the known thiols. And we're really starting to click on that. And that's starting to materialize with four elite varieties that uh, just got expanded into the three major growing states at at different farms this year. Wow. That's pretty cool. So, okay, four new elite varieties coming out of that. And I want to talk about those. We'll probably, um, you know, dive into those a little bit uh, on the other side of the break. Uh, but that's a, but it's really interesting. You mentioned there that, that hops have started to be bred for flavor because that, in my understanding, is a big change, right? I mean, you know, if you're looking back in like the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, people didn't really care what flavor hops added as long as it was bitter and had high alpha acids, right? As long as it didn't have any flavor. Yeah, right. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, the, the breeding goals of, of, of that time, that era in the early 70s, let's say, it was just to get the alpha production up. Mm-hmm. I mean, hops, uh, you know, are a commodity uh, in terms of alpha and, and global uh, alpha demand and supply, for sure. 
I mean, these are things that are traded in drums, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> right. Um, you know, so that's, and they did that very successfully. So like in 1970, I believe two or three, maybe even a little bit earlier, Comet, you know, was bred as one of the first high alpha lines. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it just went on from there. I mean, you know, varieties pre Comet or so in that era were, were rarely above 10% alpha. Now we're, you know, we can, we can crux 20% sure. routinely. So these, this is just, you know, breeding success for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, for example, something like Citra yeah. uh, really um, was something that was created in the early 90s. And I think a lot of people probably know this by now, but there was a time when they didn't. Um, it was not accepted by the big brewers because it had too much style character, too much uh, citrus, too much tropical, too much, you know, <laughs> maybe it got a little OG, um, you know, <laughs> right. um, but not until, you know, the mid 2000s, 2007 did it you know, start producing gold medal beers at the, uh, at the GABF. Right. Right. For instance. It, I mean, yeah. it's hard. It's, I think it is still hard for some people. I think like you said, most people are aware of this now, but it is still hard for some people to understand that Citra, the aroma hop, right. The number one aroma hop in the country was bred for its alpha acids, for it's just bitterness but all that mm-hmm. stuff that we love about Citra is not how the, what that hop was bred for. <laughs> it's actually a daughter of hollow town middle fruit. Oh, believe wow. it or not. I didn't know that actually. Yeah. yeah. It's it's pretty remarkable. So a lot of the efforts in the 80s was actually to replicate uh, classic German and European continental hops in the US. So we had a little bit more supply security because I believe it was in 86 or so there was an importation issue with with um you know some pesticide residue uh harmonization issues and we mm-hmm. you know we couldn't get the, we couldn't get the Sats or the Hollertown Middle Fru or the Tetanang into the country to make a lot of beers. There was a huge effort in 86 that yielded uh, Crystal, which is one of our favorite hops here at Sierra Nevada. Mm-hmm. All through the same breeding effort, Crystal, Liberty, Mount Hood, and I believe there was a fourth one, all came out of that effort. Yeah. None of which really did a great job of <laughs> uh, replacing, say, like a uh, Hollertau hop. Mm-hmm. but um, really created a lot of interesting hops that, you know, uh, the early craft brew folks, like, you know, the the 90s here in Nevada and early 2000s brewers really took advantage of. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're right. And, it, you know, it's interesting that these crosses, right, that you're talking about, it's a daughter of of middle fruits. So that's an important piece of this, right, of, of hop breeding, because that's what you're making, right? You're making crosses of other hop plants and you're trying to get something um you know a a daughter like you said that produces a certain specific uh flavor right i mean that's like high level high level hop breeding right is just making a cross of two two hop plants and then trying to produce something um that that brewers want in terms of flavor and aroma it's a numbers game yeah i mean when you're making a cross you have hundreds and hundreds of new progeny and you need to go through a lot of motions to to assess them all and make sure that they're not super susceptible to disease and mildews and things like that. And then you have to get enough of it in, in the ground actually growing on the trellis to harvest it and have people brew with it. Yeah. It's it's quite the effort. And I'm here talking you to, to you today. Uh, but I got to tell you, there are a lot of people uh, very involved and highly invested in this. The, the technical committee at Hop Quality Group and our, our brewing and sensory folks within the group, uh, folks from like Founders and Allagash and just all over Stone. I mean, the, the, the group of people um, involved in this is pretty remarkable. Um, I mean, there's there's a whole lot of passion in this project. And <laughs> I, I feel very fortunate every day to, to, to be part of it for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, and that's and that's one of the things I love about the brewing industry, right? Is the passion that people have for beer and making these quality uh, quality ingredients. And so again, you know, one of the things that again, well, one of the one of the things that we're talking about today is is breeding for thiols, these super potent uh, aroma and flavor contributors. Um, and and so that's one of the difficult challenges is how do you make a cross that uh, yes. that, that that actually produces thiols, right? Like you can cross a couple of things, and like you said, I mean, maybe it makes a really stinky, nasty beer, or maybe it makes a nice, you know, passion fruit or guava or tropical because both of those are sulfur compounds, right? 
That's right. Yeah. So skunky dank is, you know, uh, definitely a thiol. That's probably the most well-researched thiol in brewing history. Uh, 3MBT, very well-known light strike, right? Um, Definitely hop-related, no doubt about it. Um, People have tried really hard over the years to minimize it, whereas others have made, you know, brewing empires out of it uh, with clear glass and, and, and skunky <laughs> beer, uh, um, very impactful flavors. You either love it or hate it for sure. Um, but you know, there, there, th- this, the, I, I talked about a little bit about the molecular tool development, uh, in the early two thousands and the nineties. And, um, and I did talk a little bit about traditional breeding for high, high alpha in the seventies. Mm-hmm. So, and you're talking about what's going to happen next and how are we going to create, I, I've started talking about super flavor hops here at Sierra Nevada. It's like, I think we can do this much like we created super alpha hops in the seventies and eighties and nineties and continue to today. Um, you know, we need to go down this path of breeding for super flavor hops. Um, so that's, you know, we talked about identifying markers, genetic markers for thiols. Mm-hmm. And finding progeny that have the right gene mix uh, for high thiol expression. That's one great way to do it. That's a project that we're going to probably launch next year uh-huh. in Hop Quality Group. You need the analytical uh, firepower to be able to run hundreds of hops and and find out which ones have the high thiols. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can use your nose to do this, but it's not nearly accurate enough to do a, a, a study like this or to, to really have a tool like this. Mm-hmm. And then you need to have, you know, the genetic infrastructure with Henning's lab and, and, and OSU and the USDA to do all the genetic fingerprinting. Um, you know, we have the genome of Cascade Hops. Actually, Sierra Nevada was one of the main funders of that several years ago. So we do have all, all that information. Now it's putting those two data sets together and saying, okay, these are the ones that have these genes and high files. Now let's cross those. Wow. All, all with the goal of making super flavorful hops. Okay. So I want, I want to hear yep. more about that, but we need to take a quick break. Uh, so let's take a, a couple minutes, give some love to sponsors, and then we'll come back and talk about some of the specific projects that HRC and HQG are doing in order to breed super flavor hops. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. I love tropical fruity flavors and IPAs. I mean, I can handle bitterness, but I'm not a huge fan of bitter bombs. I much prefer IPAs that have strong hop aroma with enough bitterness to balance the alcohol and sweetness of the style, but not to overwhelm. And one of the ways to achieve that tropical and citrusy character is to look at increasing thiol character or other components from hops. And so, Tom, I realize one of the places that we should probably start is talking about hop aroma and flavor itself. Like, how, how do you get big hop? hop aroma and flavor. Yeah, Cade. So, you know, we we're just talking about um, breeding for, for super flavor hops and how do you do that? It's, it's not just thiols. It's not just kind of relying on these super potent things. It's, it's, there's different flavor systems going on in hops and we, we know them a lot better today than we did 
uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And even, you know, for your audience, um, a lot of this research and knowledge has been, you know, put together uh, in a very digestible form in, in a lot of different books out there. Um, but, you know, um, traditionally linalool was the one that, that people focused on. And it's a monoterpene alcohol that has some really nice uh, floral citrusy character. Um, and then there was another layer of complexity where geranium got introduced, and that's kind of a rosy piece. Um, and now we know that there's free geranium rich varieties. So the hop itself has a lot of uh, just geranium ready to extract right into the beer. But there's other geranium systems going on too. There's geranium precursors and geranium esters that biotransform into other really active flavors like, like citronellol and just, um, and other really citrusy flavors. Um, so beyond thiols, you can get a lot of great floral and citrus flavor from hops through activating these different, um, systems that, that are present in different varieties. And that's, that's really how you have to think about every variety. Um, you know, like, uh, Centennial has, has it's a very high free geranium. Hop, it, it can really express rose very well. Um, you know, something like El Dorado has a lot of uh, geranial precursors, so it's maybe a great one to use. Um, you know, when you're trying to get some biotransformation going and express more flavors through fermentation. Um, and there's and there's quite a bit more down the line there. So when we're talking about breeding for flavor, um, certainly thiols is is really you know uh maybe a very primary piece where you can yeah, steer a flavor um but you also want to try to activate all these other flavor systems that hops have too so a super flavor hop is going to have like all these flavor systems packaged in that hop cone and you know so that that's that's really some some exciting stuff that i, I see happening in the next five or ten years I see. So it's not just maximizing one thing, right? It's not. It's it's the gestalt of all of it. It's the monoterpenes, the monoterpene alcohols, the sesquiterpenes, sesquiterpene alcohols, oxides, and and thiols. Just yeah, all of it. Sure, sure. I mean, there's a lot of great aldehyde chemistry there too. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of citrusy uh, notes and or like real authentic orange flavors from octanal mm -hmm. and things like that. And that gets a little bit more complex too. There's there's um, you know beta ionone and beta damascanone, which are great, wonderful flavors, really uh, driving a lot of the uh, the characteristics of say like Czech sats. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know we can't really forget all these great flavors that beers have been expressing all these years. Uh, <laughs> you know we we have found some a, a gold mine uh, in thiols, but um, you know we also can't can't forget uh, you know just. The, what's already there too and when, when we start combining them in unique way, unique ways that's when we're that's when you know the next generation of great beers and great beer flavor is going to be created and i think that's happening right now quite honestly well yeah sure i mean there was a hop that's recently come out i haven't had the chance to brew with it yet but a lot of people have been raging or raving about it raging about it <laughs> 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 I, raving more than raging but i don't know maybe raging in a good way um raging but, for it not yeah, against it there yeah. we go raging okay. for it but uh vistas that hop i mean I know it's the, the yeah. 2022 crops already sold out as my understanding that you can't even find it anywhere anymore. It, yeah. It's got a, it's got a lot of flavor systems uh, going on. And I think it's got, you know, a lot of linalool. It's got a, a lot of geraniol. I, it's not a super thiol rich variety, but um, you know, I think that maybe I don't, your listeners know, or maybe they don't that you can, you can, some varieties will amp up the thiol content as it goes deeper into maturity um, so maybe we haven't dialed in the pick window for Vista yet. I think some growers really need to experiment with that and see what it can do mm -hmm. um, from the more grapefruity tropical notes that Isles deliver. But it's it's got a lot of flavor potential. We we made our um, craft brewers conference beer with Vista this year, and it was it was a local favorite here in, in Chico, and I think it yeah people really liked it a lot. And like you said, it's sold out already. So yeah, right. I see people. And that's that was a really huge success of the Hop Research Council in the last year or two is putting that variety out. Like I said, you know, there was a time where we really had a lot of transition in HRC that the public uh, breeding program didn't put a whole lot of material out there. At the same time, um, you know, the there was a lot of great breeders working uh, and really listening to brewers. Um, uh, for, for that time period, uh, you know, coming out with things like Mosaic, which is just a, a 
it's a grand slam. It's like, you know, Hall of Fame hop, um, and Strata, I think is another one that really, Mm -hmm. uh, the breeders really listened very closely to to brewers and, and delivered. Yeah. And, and like you said, so VIST uh, is a result of the HRC funding, right? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, it's a USDA bred line. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, right. Absolutely. Public hop variety, a super flavorful hop. Uh, would you? I mm-hmm. don't know. Actually, should, would you categorize it as super flavorful? Again, I haven't. I don't have any experience. I, I think it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think um, you know our 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 concept of an aroma hop has shifted into you know aroma hop is more classical um, aroma hops, like more fine, maybe more noble hop. Um, you know, and then with the advent of Cascade, you get this a lot more potency and then at some point aroma hops became flavor hops and that it's almost that's almost like a, a bifurcation of like file positive is a flavor hop file negative but still aromatic is maybe an aroma hop um so so yeah that's some of the the terminology is evolving uh, over time so i know and that's uh, one of the things that's so hard to keep straight right it's like flavor versus aroma and then you talk to the sensory scientists like uh, like jeff daly over at haas and he's like you know flavor and aroma are the same <laughs> you know but there's differences right there there's nuance around all of it uh, yeah i think that there's yeah. there's a marketing angle there you definitely want to differentiate things as as, as you know you get more extreme potency and you start expressing new, new flavors. I think it was really the, uh, the German hop industry uh, really coined and um, did a good job of getting flavor hops um, as like a, you know, a, a common uh, term. I think, mm. I think some uh, Japanese brewers also did that. Yeah. And well, and it's cool, right? Because we, we were talking about, you, you know, brewing this, brewing, the, or I'm sorry, breeding these hops for super flavor. So again, this is a success project from uh, from the HRC, but it sounded like uh, there were quite a few other projects that are going on between both uh, HRC, the Hop Research Council and HQG, the, the hop quality group, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think they're, they're they have individual kind of threads going They're They're really not intertwined. Mm-hmm. um right now but um you know there's nothing to say that they can't be in the future but certainly we tap into the same resources from the two groups um i'm one of the few individuals that's uh, intimately involved in both so i have a unique perspective there and sometimes need to be careful <laughs> not to favor one over the other um <laughs> but you know in hrc there's a lot of other things we do not just not just breed and in hop quality group there's a lot of other things we do and not, and not just just breed but um but yeah, so it, it's it's infinitely interesting stuff. Yeah, and so part of the breeding again is like breeding for for th- like for for you know th- super flavorful hops. But so so like, how does that how does that work? I mean, how do, how does mm-hmm. the, say I don't know pick one hop hop uh, quality group or hop research group? How would they approach that? Right, like how would they approach trying to you know maximize super flavorful hops? Or are those just totally different issues? It starts with your cross. Right. You just make an intelligent cross based on what you know. So, I mean, it doesn't, you know, t- take a whole lot of thought to say, hey, this variety has a lot of flavor and this variety has a lot of flavor. Uh, let's put them together and see what they can do. <laughs> and then, again, you have to have that that supporting infrastructure to to grow it all out. And then you have to have the passionate brewers and, and scientists to, to do the back end work and, and and say, this is the one we want, and this is why. Let's go. Let's go with this one. Let's scale it up. And that's really the step that we're in right now. Um, but we we have we have taken quite a huge bite uh, in the hop quality group, um, and we have a lot more varieties coming through the next several years. There's a lot of work to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got these first four elites, which are yeah. wonderful. There's there's one in particular that the group is is going going nuts over. Um, and when I first presented the information to the group, uh, I just showed, uh, I just shared a thial chart and right in the middle of this is just basically, um, you know, just a, a bar graph basically. And the, this one hop was right in the middle and it just spiked a huge amount of, of thial. So on the Y axis, it was like pegged at hundred percent and all the other varieties, you know, were kind of in the weeds. So it just looked like there was like a big middle finger standing <laughs> up. Uh, and, and since yeah. then, I think I improvised that in that call and it's now known as the middle finger hop. The so that's, finger. that's out, that's growing right now. It's a baby crop right now in, in okay. each of the, the major States. So that's the one that is, uh, we, we hope to, 
you know, to see it, um, to realize it as a super flavor hop one of these days. And then the other three are, are not too shabby. Mm-hmm. Um, they're really in line with the more citra mosaic levels, uh, strata levels of, of style content. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's going to be really exciting to see how those, those grow out. And then next year we have a whole new class. So you've got <laughs> a lot of these decisions to make. Uh, multiple times a year on on what we're going to go with and what we're going to, you know, uh, step back from and so on and so forth. Oh, how fun. I'd be in part of those of those conversations that are driving like the hops of the future. I mean, that'd just be a lot of fun to sit in that room um, and and make those kinds of decisions. But so, okay, so so that that hop, for example, the the leader of those four prime varieties, um, there that it you said it's got high thiol character. So what are we talking about? Like what kind of flavors and, and, and aromas would that hop have? Well, I guess just a, a- a brief primer on what we know about thiols right now and hops. Um, hops have a lot of free thiol. It's a very unique feature of, of hops. They can have a lot of free thiol. So as I mentioned, like free geranial before, it'll, it'll just extract right into whatever you're, you know, putting it into. Um, wine, uh, for example, and grapes do not. They have thiols bound in in precursors that need to be liberated by fermentation right hops also have a huge amount of bound thiol um, on top of the free thiol but as brewers we're really accessing the free thiols and winemakers are jealous of us that we have (laughs) that luxury Mm -hmm. and i don't think that's really understood by brewers uh, a lot of brewers are chasing all the bound thiol and hops all the time uh, by trying to come up with a special, you know, uh, yeast. I mean, honestly, I, I, that's such a, that's such an awesome effort, and we've spent a lot of time and energy working with with folks on 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 that as well. And it's been a, just a super cool research topic that's been presented on a lot lately. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is, is that winemakers are jealous of hops for their high thiol content. <laughs> their free thiol content, yeah. Their free thiol content. So we, you know, and and and, um, I think one day we'll figure out how to unlock the hidden potential of bound thiols and create. Uh, uh, who knows? I mean, so the the precursors are just in orders of magnitude higher concentration than the free thiols, but it doesn't seem like you can really readily liberate those and just have these super juice super tropical bombs Mm -hmm. um that way then again you don't need more than you know a couple hundred parts per trillion of these compounds to express a fruit bomb or a guava bomb or a passion fruit bomb you don't Uh, they're super potent that's what's so great about them right yeah um so so going back to the basics of free thiols and hops and what we really talk about today are uh, two compounds primarily. So the compound formerly known as 4-MMP, um, which I think you know, people will start gravitating towards calling it 4-SMP, mm-hmm. not that it makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. And another compound, 3-S-4-MP. Okay. Those are the two that we really know uh, have significant impact on beer flavor. They are in high concentrations in different hop varieties, and they express wonderfully bright citrus or grapefruit, really, in the case of 4SMP. Um, you know, that's the one that people will consider caddy from time to time. And then 3S4MP, which is an analog of 3MH, which is now I, I call 3SH, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. that's the passion fruit bomb. Okay. Um, so, and, and you put those together and you get some really wonderful stuff starting to happen. Um, a hop like Citra has both of those at pretty decent concentrations. Um, a hop like Mosaic has just an incredibly high amount of 3S4MP. It really expresses the tropical wonderfully and then you and then i mean and then simcoe has a lot of the four smp so you have the grapefruit coming from there so mm. you know here at sierra nevada we've gotten to the point where we can just talk about varieties and we just we just know that these things are happening at least um, a, a group of us here mm. um so um you know that's that's kind of 
when you talk about super thiol levels, you're really talking about uh, those two or three compounds that are very well researched at this time. There's more. There's more to it. Mm-hmm. Like I mentioned before, you know, 15, 18 years ago when I was sitting on the sniff ports, sniffing through hops for uh, as a lifestyle, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot more thiols in there. And like for crystal, for instance, has, has you know, a thiol in there that is crystal that we haven't identified yet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can just go on down the line. Uh, and and different varieties have unknown, you know, I think thiols that have yet to be, be named, or, or or at least maybe somebody has identified them. Well, they just haven't, you know, published that or shared that quite yet. Right, name and it's it's. Mm-hmm. But the analytical analytical power is now there. Um, mm-hmm. Here at Sierra, I, I I just I just bought an instrument uh, last year um, to quantitate thiols in, in, in these hops, oh, cool. um, in, in the publicly bred hops. So we're going to be doing all that work here. We're doing it right now, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so all the hop quality group experimentals are going to come through my lab here at Sierra Nevada, uh, to, to, that's where we're going to get that, that hard, uh, that hard data on thiols to marry with the, uh, with the genetic, uh, component from the USDA. Yeah. Interesting. So, but so that's essentially what you're doing is you're taking those hops, you're measuring the thiol concentrations of those, and then that gives you the ability to go back to, um, you know, the the breeders and say, hey, look, here these hops have mm-hmm. these high concentrations. What happens if we cross these? It's the analytical tool to be able mm-hmm. to make crosses uh, that express high thiol character. That's it. I mean, that's the concept right there. That's yeah. so cool. That's so fun. And again, you know, you you mentioned the the low th- flavor threshold of these styles. I mean, that's something I know people talk about it a lot, but like it took me a while to just sort of understand like like the the range of what that means. So uh, so like they're super low, like you said, parts per trillion. Whereas geraniol or linalool, those are in that like parts per million range. And then like esters, like mm-hmm. isoamyl acetate, you mentioned hefeweizens, right? The banana ester yeah, of a hefeweizen is in a part per thousand so it's like one milligram part per million or, yeah, or part, yeah part per million, part per million. yeah mm-hmm. but in yes yeah, sorry Al- alcohol is yeah. in part per thousand alcohol is in part ethanol, per thousand yeah there we go yeah <laughs> ethanol that's exactly right but but it's so crazy to think like those those things are in such a high concentration you know i mean you're you're talking about millions of times <laughs> you know more uh more intense uh that yeah the, one drop in an olympic sized swimming pool and the whole thing is just like a, a punch bowl yeah <laughs> there, there you go i mean that's crazy to think of that and but but it's super cool right like you mentioned a punch bowl right because you get gua- guava passion fruit you know um you know, uh, citrus grapefruit all of those wonderful flavors even mango is one of the ones that that mm-hmm. i've uh, uh that that i've heard as well uh for these styles so that's really cool to think about um these maybe being the the next wave of hops now so and and we did mention sort of at the top of this segment about you know building uh you know super flavorable hops is more than just thigh hulls so there's also a component of this that's looking at like we said those other uh, components monoterpene alcohols and such right that's also a part of the efforts of hrc and hop quality group i i think so i think um you know we we do have big brewer members at hrc and they're looking for things like a willamette replacement Oh, mm-hmm. um, so, you know, they're very sensitive to those, those, those flavors and, you know, they're, they're highly trained and they're great brewers looking for something very specific. And, in and, and oftentimes that's, that's in opposite direction of what craft brewers are looking for. They're looking for the, the absence mm-hmm. of these and they're looking for just the cleanliness and maybe just some really nice subtle notes. Um, so, um, you know, for sure there, there, there's that going on. Um, so at HRC, we distinctly, um, brew single hop beers in light lagers and then in IPA. So everything that we, we breed out of that system, um, gets evaluated in, in the two different beer styles. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, whereas in, in hop quality group, I think we're just, we're really just making IPAs and, 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 you know, highly hoppy, hoppy expressed, um, uh, you know, formulations. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not creating some really nice, uh, no, you know, we're not finding any in really nice kind of very neutral hops too. Um, we have definitely found found those as well. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's like you said. I mean, uh, was it Citra? Yeah, Citra has is a daughter of Mid- Halotau Midafru, right? So it's like, yeah. You, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that some of the crosses are going to have characteristics. It, you like- know, it's amazing. Um, you, you'll see every type of hop uh, born out of one cross. Oh. It's really remarkable, at least aromatically. You'll you'll get stuff with zero aroma potential whatsoever, and um, you know that maybe that would make a great ornamental somewhere, but it's not going to work uh, <laughs> as a, as uh, as anything else. Right. Um, and then you'll get super highly expressed flavor and aroma. Uh, you know, uh, and they're all you know created at the same time from the from the same parents. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, which is crazy, right? and and that's such a that's one of the hard parts about hot breeding. I mean, I've mentioned it a couple times on the show before, but uh, but that that amount of crosses that you have to have to narrow it down, right? I mean, I was thinking I was talking with um uh uh with uh, Dr. Renee Erickson, um, who used to work with John Henning, but she's now in a different part of the USDA. We were talking about drought tolerance and heat resistance mm-hmm. and all that sort of yeah. stuff, um, and she was saying even to make hybrids or to make crosses that are uh that ha- survive. On under those con- those conditions, you have to make hundreds of crosses. You would make hundreds of them and then yeah. narrow it down to maybe five or ten, right? And then narrow those five or ten down. And those five or ten may all just get chunked or you might get one out of those. Mm-hmm. And then one goes and then gets scaled up and that one also might get chunked, <laughs> right? <laughs> so then and then so you're you're doing this over a period of years. And it's it seems like mm-hmm. from the outside looking in, incredibly daunting. Yeah, but when you do find one, you you ride that horse, you 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 go, and you kind of you you know, yeah, um, it doesn't happen frequently, but that's why you just you have to have this pipeline full of things coming down because you don't know when that one's going to pop out, and you better be paying attention, close attention when that one does pop out because you don't want to miss it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's this big effort um, in the last couple of years to go back into the breeding that was done from i said that kind of like real calm period where no real public releases were made we were still making crosses that whole time but nobody was really looking hard enough interesting so there was an effort recently and we're still doing this uh, we and we recently hired another breeder uh, kayla altendorf Hmm. to compliment john henning up in the state of washington and her first task was to go through this 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 experimental hop beard of all the crosses made during that time and figure it out are they still so they're still around those crosses yeah are, oh, yeah wow. well there's a good there's a good uh maybe graduate uh project for you there to, to, <laughs> oh, to help to help kayla work through all those and figure you know try to find out if there are any any you know gold nuggets in that in that in that mine in there right right um, i've got to think she's gonna have to have somebody to help is it just like <laughs> acres of planted hops that are just out there yeah. and and yeah who they've just been growing <laughs> every year and <laughs> that's right they've been maintained we've been maintaining them wow. it's just um you know uh for whatever reason they weren't really evaluated i think um critically enough well that's amazing and, wouldn't that yeah. be cool right some some throwback hops you know not necessarily throwback hops i mean it's only we're talking about like the 80s and 90s we're not talking like you know 50 60 yeah. years ago but still that's a long time i mean the, the 90s right. are 30 years ago at this point so yeah exactly um, exactly but that'd be really cool to see some of that of uh, some of those new or some of those varieties that may have been great aroma contributors but again just because of you know leadership transitions at the time it didn't well they were, they were deselected against either yeah as well like as yeah. we were saying the, the people making the calls back then were looking for uh the absence of all these flavors so um so i'm i'm sure we've had incredible hops over the years that uh, had amazing and innovative flavor contributions that were just very quickly tossed out. Cool. Yeah, I know. Right. And then it's just to think about, I think of just all the potential um, that's there. And then, like you said, the potential that's coming down the, the, the pipeline. I mean, it's cool to think that you've got four varieties right now that you're uh, planning into fields to see how they, uh, they produce. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of work that gets to that point and still a lot of work that's left to go. But really cool to think like we're just going to, you know, keep seeing new super flavorful hop varieties. Yeah, I mean, hops are an amazing, amazing little factory of, of flavor and, and, and really interesting molecules that could have uh, other uses too. Like xanthohumol um, is an yeah. incredibly powerful molecule that some hops uh, can make quite a bit of. 
we need to start looking at xanthohumol contents of hops and, and seeing what we can do there. And there's a lot of economic value to xanthohumol, uh, you know, and there's probably more as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's more to, to aroma and flavor, I think, in hops. I think the, you know, the, the story is, is, uh, more expansive than, than maybe we, we think it is. And I'm sure others are, are well, certainly, uh, some great scientists working in the hop industry know this very well and mm. are, are trying, trying to make this happen too. Yeah. Well, and, and like you mentioned too, I mean, the free, free thiol content of hops, it's like, it's like playing with, you know, borrowed money. It's or not, or, you know, maybe not borrowed money, but just got your thumb on the scale. You've got all this potential right here, um, in free thops and it's really cool or free thiols. It's really cool to think of like Berkeley yeast and, and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. Omega and Imperial and all the yeast labs and escarpment that are coming out with new strains that are releasing thiols from their bound precursors, you know, but like you mentioned, it's kind of, we've, we have already this resource of free thiols and it's a Mm -hmm. way to maximize that you know more maybe more quickly or maybe in combination too right i mean that'd be really cool to see you know some free thiol hops with high concentration of three high free thiols and then bound and you get maybe some different biotransformation character i mean the world is our oyster um (laughs) i guess right these are these are all very good pursuits i have to say yeah um they're all very valuable and um well you know just just from the wine industry, they spend so much time thinking about liberating the thiols from, from grapes and cer- certain certain wine styles, right? Um, they really jump through a lot of hoops to do that. It's a it's a big effort. Um, you know, we have it readily available to us, you know, readily extractable into our beers mm-hmm. uh, just through, you know, good dry hopping technique. Um, so, yeah, why not try to just amp that up as much as possible, too? Right. Right, exactly. And that's what you're doing uh, through the Hop mm-hmm. Research Group and, and Hop Quality Group. I mean, and, you know, as well as other projects. I mean, again, I don't I don't want to make it sound like Hop Research Group or Hop Quality Group are dedicated to thiol production. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that's just me. <laughs> right, that's just Tom. Because <laughs> uh, they're also doing a lot of other great work, too. But it's really fun yeah. to sort of peek behind the hood, right? Or peek under the hood and see, uh, man, I'm just messing up all my analogies today. But oh, well, I'll probably get listener feedback uh. on that. But it's <laughs> Looking under the hood, there we go, to see, uh, you know, what, how these hops are made, how, how the sausage is made. And it's pretty cool uh, to see what, what varieties are coming out um, in, in the future. So, so we, we talked a lot about, you know, thiols and super flavorful hops and characters and stuff like that. But, but if you want brewers to take away one thing from today's episode, what would it be? I would say that, um, you know, really flavor impactful public hops are, are on the way. I think I think Vista is a great you know a, a great one. Um, I think they're they're just gonna you're gonna be seeing more and and hopefully they're gonna be uh, even more impactful and and interesting and innovative and uh, agronomically sustainable. Uh, well, I know I, for one, am really excited about the next generation of hops, right? I, I just love the way that we've come uh, so far, or love how far we've come, and I can't wait to see the future ones. But uh, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about uh, that we didn't get to touch on today? Um, yeah, we didn't get to talk about Pilsner or Hellas. Oh. <laughs> well, damn, we'll have to have you back on another show <laughs> <laughs> to talk about Pilsner or Hellas. Uh, but, but yeah, but I did really enjoy the conversation today about super flavorable hops. So thanks Tom for, for joining me in the brew lab. All right, Kate, it's been fun, man. Really enjoy your work. Uh, keep it going. All right. Well, I will. And we've got a lot of other interesting content over at brewlosophy.com and another show called the brewlosophy podcast. So be sure to swing by and listen in for more brewing science related wisdom. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.